Chris Monroe. Starting off this video strong with the mythical man himself, the king of the kiss, the master of small talk, the sexual predator of Los Angeles, prank invasion. Now pranks on YouTube started out pretty wholesomely until the genre became more extreme in the mid 2010s. This is due to many outlandish creators like Joey Salads, Moen E.T., Vitaly, Kobe Person, and one other that I'll be discussed later in the video. But Prank Invasion was the fakest as Chris would go up to random girls and play a quick game for a quick kiss. And to make them more interesting, he would make up fake holidays like No Clothes Family Day and Mommy Makeout Day. If you wanted to play a quick game for a quick kiss. Sure. You're down? Okay. Um, how about this? If I can guess your son's age, I get a kiss. Yeah? Okay. Um, Pretty soon enough, the titles and contents within these prank videos would get more extreme, like when he went to a high school and asked if girls were 18. If they were, they would get a sloppy kiss from Mr. Creepy over here. His videos would commonly get age restricted and flat out removed, leading to not much money being sent his way. So he made a website where, if you pay, Chris will teach you all the secrets he knows about getting women. But he kept flip-flopping with the price and even within the promotions themselves, which was one of the many shady things about it. Access the invasion method only costs $29.99 a month. Guys. Whoa, whoa, first of all, what the fuck? I came to sign up with $5. Now you want to charge me $30. Plus it has been proven on more than one occasion that the girls seen in his videos are hired actresses who aren't even told the full details of the shoot. One even came forward on the H3H3 H3 channel after Chris showed her ass on camera. Speaking of H3H3, H3, it was clear that after getting a lot of attention from the reaction videos, a lot of his views came from that. People who enjoyed watching his content ironically, and not the little kids who tolerated them. So he catered more towards this demographic, which failed, and he soon faded to irrelevancy. The only way, in his mind, he could get it back was make a video where he made out with his sister. Half-sister, but that doesn't make a difference at all, does it? Before disappearing, he tried starting beef on Twitter with random people, including challenging Ethan Klein to a chess match. In September 2019, his YouTube channel would be terminated and not much has come from Chris since. Hey guys, it's me again. So I haven't posted a video in seven days. I know I've been slacking, but I can explain. So Brian Lee, mainly going by Rice Gum, this controversial creator began his YouTube career pretty humbling with gaming content. His viewership was small, yet modest, up until he began a series called These Kids Must Be Stopped in December 2015. This was during the rise of commentary channels, leading to many watching his new style of videos. These were actually really well liked at first, as Rice simply roasted kids on the app musically. He wasn't overly mean or anything either, just harmless jokes. But with this success, Rice's ego took over. He became arrogant, greedy, and was increasingly harsher in commentary videos. Rice would even make diss tracks on some of the young kids that he would criticize. This appeared petty and was a bad look for him. His personality changed for the worse as he focused more on the numbers and less on making enjoyable videos. He began flexing and started fake drama just for attention. There was also the time that he complained about not being in YouTube Rewind. His argument is that other YouTubers with less subscribers than him are irrelevant compared to him. That thought process would be his main defense for quite a while. During a live stream in 2016, he laughed and asked really stupid questions to a girl who had been raped, including the infamous line, <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> no, no, but did it feel good though? No, I didn't. Damn, it was like expensive. how long like, was it? How long? No, it was like in time of the, like how long like did the rape last for? Rice got into other controversies at this time, like lying to multiple girls on live streams, smashing Gabby Hanna's phone after she made fun of him for having a ghostwriter, and made a diss track against Jake Paul with one of his exes. In October 2017, YouTuber iDubbbz made a Content Cop episode on him, which currently has over 50 million views. In it, Ian criticizes him for his ego, faking a giveaway, his past controversies, and his musical abilities. He even ended it off with a diss track. Rice then retaliated by making his own diss track on Ian, which came off as pathetic. All he does is flexes his wealth and states that iDubbbz must be obsessed with him. During the summer of 2018, Rice released his Hong Kong vlogs, where he visited the region and acted like a complete idiot, similar to Logan Paul's Japan vlogs. 
Oh yeah, like in China, there's always jokes about like Asians eating cats and dogs. And like I'm in China and I've been kind of looking for the past hour and I haven't seen a restaurant or anything serving that. I'm confused because like I want to try. I'm always open to try new things. Then came December 31st, 2018, when Rice released a video promoting a gambling site. The website was a massive scam and he mainly showed it off to his young, impressionable fans. This did not sit well and many other YouTubers bashed him for the promotion. In response, he tried to snitch on other creators who promoted the site and gave out passcodes to Amazon gift cards that were already used. Damage has been done. You guys already saw a money hungry side of me and it is what it is. And there's nothing I can really do but say sorry and give you these Amazon gift cards. So I'm sorry, it just wouldn't happen again. His most recent drama came up last summer with the Save the Kids scandal. This was a cryptocurrency he and many influencers from the FaZe Clan promoted which was actually a pump and dump scheme. What's worse is that it was promoted as charitable, as proceeds could go to children in need. That was false, of course, and Rice has since stuck to streaming on Twitch. Welcome back to another brand new video, another day, another banger. Guys, on today's video, we have an insane video, guys. Amir Futuli. No more widely as NNA Productions, this Emirate YouTuber spent most of his time making 3AM challenge videos. These were clearly aimed at a much younger audience and never changed in format. This went on for years as all of his videos were indistinguishable besides the person or thing he was calling. Amir would start off by spinning a fidget spinner, begging for you to subscribe, and give out a spiel about a free gift card giveaway. Wanna join my free gift cards giveaway? Subscribe to my channel, like the video, and turn notifications on. And finally, tell me on the comment section that you subscribe. For as far as we know, there was never a winner for this contest. It could be fraud or just pure laziness. Then Amir would shout out all his social media, do a scrolling montage, and then start the 3am call. He would FaceTime various fictional characters by showing lousy PNGs of them. After repeating information 10 times over, the character would appear in his home. Of course, this was always just a shitty prop being held up by his friend. Yo, look at this, guys! Oh my god, guys, look at that! Yo, it's, it's insane! Yo! It is actually George's hand, guys! These videos would get longer and longer from 2017 onwards, just to squeeze out as much ad revenue as possible. This would be fine if Amir actually had some quality or substance to his videos. But he didn't. He also clickbaited his non-3am videos, like the time he lied about playing Fortnite with Lil Pump. By 2018, several big YouTubers would call him out on his lazy content, such as Memeulous, Pyrocynical, and Moist Critical. Oh well, I'm not sleeping tonight. Jesus Christ. Did you see that? And he did, did you see her at the end too when he was going through his ninth time of telling you to subscribe, like, and check out his Instagrams? These guys exposed Amir to many outside his initial childhood audience, and he got a lot of hate. But he still kept at it, not changing anything about his videos. Then came June 2019, when popular streamer and content creator Etika passed away. Instead of doing what a normal person would do, like mourn Etika's death, Amir decided to make some content out of it. He made a 3am challenge video on Etika as soon as his death was announced, which pissed off everyone. He even made it seem like it was his audience's fault for suggesting that he make this video, which is just manipulative. He didn't delete the video, but instead privated it so that he could keep the ad revenue, which is just downright evil in my opinion. He doubled down on this during an apology, where he insisted that these haters didn't care about Etika, and that the ad revenue was going to go to the late streamer. And it goes to Etika, alright guys? So all the ad money goes to Etika from this video, alright guys? So guys, I have a lot of things to say, and this video is gonna be unedited, alright guys? So I'm getting so much hate this past two days for making a 3am video on Etika. That's what everybody thinks. Which was most likely a defense made to soften the blow. In reality, of course, he clickbaited someone's death and made money off of it. Last year, Amir got more involved in boxing, even winning a few matches. But besides uploading some content around that and a few miscellaneous challenge videos, he's rarely active on YouTube now. What? No! I was talking about D like DZ. Man, where did you learn how to talk like that? Shane Dawson. Now, it must be said that I've never liked Shane. I've always found him unfunny and too outlandish, but even worse, he's manipulative. Most assume that all the drama happened around mid-2020, but he's always been bashed for his abrasive content. 
Shane has a history of doing blackface, making uncomfortable jokes relating to young girls, and then apologizing for it once called out. However, these apologies were always half-baked and were really just a way to blow off steam. And that isn't me talking out of my ass, he literally said it himself years later. Every apology video I've ever made has been a, from fear. It's, it's me sitting at home thinking the whole world hates me and crying and hyperventilating and then just turning on a webcam and just saying I'm sorry and then hoping people know I'm a good person and then it'll go away. And that is stupid. That is something that a child does. One pretty problematic aspect of Shane's YouTube career was the creation of Millie, a puppet meant to be an 8-year-old girl. The conversations with this child puppet would always get strangely sexual, which is more comfortable when you realize how young Shane's audience was. A large chunk of his fan base, mainly a decade ago, were young teen girls. He seemed to know that, and interacted with them in real life. At the 2012 VidCon, he even had these fans come up on stage and impersonate black people with him. Then there is the Willow Smith video, where he is seen pretending to jerk off to the thought of the underage singer. Once getting attention in more recent years, her family would come out to denounce this really fucked up joke. But this isn't a joke, it's just being offensive of no punchline. The punchline here should have been Will Smith coming out and slapping him across the face. Now that would have been funny. Oh, and he would constantly record himself on Omega and suggest teens to strip for him. One of those highly critical of Shane Dawson was Bobby Burns, who made his video in 2018. He of course calls him out on his manipulative behavior and questions his conspiracy video content. Plus the use of blackface, don't forget that. Shane happened to stumble upon it and give some commentary to Bobby's points, except for skipping over the blackface part. He didn't decide to befriend Bobby and feature him in various videos. This really messed up Bobby, as not only was he anxious around Shane and his friends, but also because he was being presented as this massive hater. You don't seem mean, oh. it just seems... Dumb. Oh. <laughs> you look pretty- Oh, you look what? Oh. <laughs> huh. So I'm dumb? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. What makes me dumb? I didn't say you were dumb, I said you looked dumb. There's a big difference. Do I look fat? <laughs> He was constantly attacked online by Shane's fans, yet the famous YouTuber would never stand up for him. Yet at the same time, he tried to make Bobby feel bad about criticizing him, which really screwed him up mentally. Overall, it seems like Shane messed with him so much just permanently, leading to his content getting more disjointed. Shane would be bashed at a much larger scale starting in 2019, when part of a 2015 podcast went viral. In it, he jokes about having sex with his cat, which just sounds too real. Joke or not, it's flat out zoophilia. <laughs> One time, I laid my cat down on her back. Are you gonna get arrested for this? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. No. Think about it. Mm, I don't think so. Okay, go ahead. I didn't penetrate. <laughs> I laid the cat down on her back I and then I, I, I moved her little chicken legs, like, you know, spread open or whatever. And I was like, if I just like hump, but like on her tummy, like that's not weird. Like, whatever. And then I humped and I humped and I humped and it kept going and kept going. And I came all over the cat. No, you did not. It was like my first sexual experience. No I was also way. like 19, <laughs> so it's like, you know. Wait a minute. Wait a second. Did you just say you came on a cat? Guys, I think. On June 26, 2020, Shane made the infamous video, Taking Accountability, readdresses many of these previously mentioned controversies. All it is is a 20 plus minute video of Shane kissing everyone's ass and rolling over defeat, declaring how he's going to quit YouTube, but he returned a year later with a failed comeback. Nobody respects him anymore, and that's for the best. He's scummy and acts all emotional once getting called out. The hate was a long time coming, he just denied it until it built up all the way. Remember back in 2018 when that channel Pop Blast made a video accusing Shane of being pedophilic? We all collectively passed them off as attention seeking, but they were right all along. They just had weak evidence. For now though, Shane will remain an unnoticeable stain in the vast collection of YouTube literature, just waiting for another controversy to bring him back into the limelight. Let's just hope that never happens. I'm a good YouTuber, and all these other people suck. I'm the better YouTuber. Kai Gallagher. One of the lesser known creators on this list, and for an understandable reason. Going by Foodizen, after the creation of his newest channel in early 2020, he's become known for mocking other people's deaths. His previous YouTube accounts would be deleted as he made multiple videos mocking Jacksepticeye's late father. Kai says the man deserved to die and then made 3AM challenge videos revolving around a haunting. He claims Jack's father is now haunting his house and must be dealt with. We're going to be talking about why Jacksepticeye's father deserved to die. He is burning in hell right now, and he is screaming in eternal damnation. 
for all the things he did. After getting his accounts terminated, he would return under the Foodizen channel, where multiple more problematic videos would be made. When respected Minecraft YouTuber Technoblade passed away in June of 2022, Kai immediately made a video cheering his death. Technoblade is literally gross. He is a, like, have you ever read the Bible? Like, this man is out here promoting, promoting sodomy? Like, this guy deserved it. Fuck Technoblade. What's worse is that a week later, he claimed Technoblade was actually still alive and living in Israel. Not only that, but he made false allegations like that he's pretending to be a transgender, groomed minors, and that his entire family was into zoophilia. Kai continued his ramblings by now insisting Technoblade faked his death due to his channel dying and that the man hated his fans. On another channel, Kai made a 3am video where he even included, quote, he deserved to die, in parentheses. After this got even more hate, he made another 3am video claiming Mr. Beast helped him make it and that Techno is a racist. Even when he stopped making videos on Techno, he continued mocking people's deaths, such as Snoop Dogg's mother. He also made numerous spam accounts to post free Robux scams and sent animal abuse videos to YouTuber DJ Cook. After making a fake apology and the drama died down, the Foodizen channel was practically dead. And on November 13th, 2022, Kai privatized all remaining videos. Here's hoping he never makes another video again. What's up, guys? Back with another 3 a.m. challenge. This is my very first 3 a.m. challenge in my new house. Jason Ether, going by JStation. This man is easily the worst 3 a.m. challenge YouTuber. His first channel was even removed after Jason was charged with multiple accounts of trespassing in 2016. This was because of multiple 24-hour challenges, where he would break into places after hours. He would be arrested once again in 2018, after trespassing at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Jason stated that he did this to retrieve a bag somebody had stolen, and called for a boycott of the theme park in protest. Similar to NNA Productions, he got in trouble for making 3AM challenge videos on dead celebrities, not only with Etika, but also Mac Miller, in these horrible videos. Jay would attempt to contact these individuals using an Ouija board and insist that they are talking to him. And we're gonna take out the Ouija board right here. You wanna open it, bro? Bro, bro, let's do it. Let's, let's do, do it. it. Guys, to make this even okay. crazier, we got black candles all around, guys. That helps invoke all the spirits. They're used for black magic. It smells good? Nah, bro. It smells <laughs> like spirit, bro. I don't know what that is. He would get called out on this by various other YouTubers, such as Keemstar. The controversial drama alert host would also call him out for a Suicide Force video, only a week after Logan Paul did to capitalize on the attention. This backfired, however, because he admitted that it was only for the views. Jay and Keemstar continued their feud after this. In mid-2019, Jay staged a robbery at his house, which most were skeptical of. It appeared staged as no evidence was taken from his home, and his bruises only appeared to be on one side of his face. They just punched me in the face. They choked me out, pushed me against this wall. I struggle around. I end up on here. Look at his blood all up on here, here. They're beating the fuck out of me right there. Eventually I went unconscious, tried to escape. I ran over here, there's blood all on my couch. On January 21st, 2020, JayStation uploaded two videos in which he insists his girlfriend brutally died in a car crash. And of course, knowing how this man is, he made a 3 a.m. Ouija board video about her. What? What did you take? I took the teddy bear. Are you kidding me? The teddy bear, where is it? It's over on the counter. Like, if you want me to get it, maybe that'll help her spirit come to us. Yeah, Jay, grab it. Okay, okay, I'm gonna go over there right now and just grab the freaking teddy bear, dude. The Yo, the candles- Whoa! What girlfriend, dude? Bro! How did that move there? Wait, that's your purse! I swear to God, as soon as that happened, the candles just flickered. This came under fire, and it was soon clear that he faked all of this, as his girlfriend, Alexa, was revealed to be alive. She came forward with the full story after the drama got so big, stating how Jay was physically and mentally abusive to her. He forced her to be in part of the videos, including giving voice clips for the Ouija board one. A back and forth commenced with some assuming both parties involved were saying things for publicity. This was harder to believe, until Jay's ex, Iko, shared her experience with him. 
Jay would be arrested in February 2020 due to Alexa reporting him to the police. This was allegedly due to assaulting her with a weapon, which also seemed to be what led to YouTube demonetizing Jay's entire channel. It would be banned altogether a year later. He eventually made a new channel, where he doesn't upload as much. The last drama to occur with Jay was when he tried to take down the Nerd City's video made on him. He got so petty that he changed his Twitter header to an image of Nerd City's girlfriend. This did not work out for Jay Station in the end, luckily. He's wearing a freaking mask out there! What the freak? Oh, don't! Whoa, what whoa, the whoa, freak? Whoa, 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 what the freak, guys? Jeez! He's there! Hello? What the freak, guys? He's not even wearing a shoe, guys! It's not money, it's not fame, it's not numbers, it's none of that. It is literally to stay true to who I am. Tana Mojo. I actually already made a full video on Tana, so I'll summarize what I said. Mojo actually started out her YouTube career pretty humblingly and started making simple storytime videos back in 2015. But soon, with added attention, she began to exaggerate them. This included the saga of videos she made on a supposed stalker, which she milked for quite a while. She soon began collaborating with much more famous creators such as her good friend Shane Dawson. Her first bit of drama began in late 2016 when she infamously told iDubbbz to go kill himself on a tweet. She disapproved of him commonly using the n-word in his videos despite using it in a way more hurtful way herself. You know you're a stupid nigger, right? You fucking nigger! Ian was actually really smart of how he handled this. He bided his time and went to one of her meet and greets to see Tana in person. Once this happened, he waited for her to make an exaggerated story time video on the event to then compare it to his own footage. And so the guy looks at me and he wraps his arm around me and he looks in the camera and he goes, say, and puts his thumbs up and then like blank and he says the N word, like hard R. So then I kind of try to like break free, you know what I mean? Like, like get his arm away from me and for like, and so like the first time I tried to, like he didn't like let go. And that's where my brain instincts like, okay, does he have a gun? Does he have a knife? Like whatever. This was very quick. It wasn't like he held me in for much longer. And then I pull away harder and find. The constant cop that followed destroyed her, exposing Tana for being hypocritical and a pathological liar. She soon made one of many apology videos which failed on so many levels. After taking some time to recover, Tana began focusing on music and an idea for a convention. TanaCon, as she called it, has to be one of the most embarrassing things any YouTuber has ever done. It was a disaster since the venue was too small for the large amount of teenage girls who went. The outside was crowded and many suffered for burns and heat stroke. The inside wasn't much better, as mostly everything was cancelled. It was literally just a bunch of booths in a hallway. Tana herself spent the convention dealing with authorities who shut it down after the first day. Tana was seen as responsible for most of this as she gave little time to plan TanaCon. Anne was on vacation the week prior. Of course it wasn't all her fault, but as a leader she should expect all the blame. During the week afterwards she just cried a whole lot and falsely promised refunds. And of course, her pal Shane capitalized on the situation of his videos. After taking time to recover from this as well, she began working on her own MTV show. On it, her weird relationship with Jake Paul was shown, leading to the two getting married. Well, not really, it was all staged and the two broke up by early 2020. Later that year, she was accused by a few of her friends of being racist, which is ironic due to how supportive she seemed to be of Black Lives Matter. Tana was said to have treated her black friends horribly and made numerous unfunny tweets being discriminatory against them. The whole drama was going to be held privately, but Tana ghosted Kayleen Barry. She then started begging for forgiveness on Twitter and made her 100th apology. But I'm aware that making this video about my emotions would do nothing but be another selfish and careless action and further the problem. I want to apologize from the bottom of my heart for being such a big part of canceled culture for the entirety of my career. I don't deserve a platform if I continue to act in such a gaslighting and irresponsible manner. Since then, she doesn't upload much on YouTube and instead shows off her highly photoshopped body on Instagram. Oh, and uh, skimming people on OnlyFans like m most people do on there. Jake Paul. It's debatable which Paul brother is worse, Logan or Jake. But even though Logan did film a dead body and tase a deceased rat, he sort of lightened up over the years. Jake on the other hand is still up to his usual antics. Jake started out as a viner, making short comedy videos. 
He then transitioned to YouTube as Vine shut down, beginning what has been known as the 2017 Viner Invasion. This is when Jake Paul ruled the entire internet. You couldn't go a day without hearing about another dumb thing that he's done with his band Team 10. He released horrible music, cheated on his girlfriend, set his pool on fire, pissed off all of his neighbors, climbed atop a news van. Jake, I wouldn't do that. Look at, I wouldn't this, crawl up there. Why? Okay. I just wouldn't do that. A lot of the neighbors are complaining. They're very upset. No, why? Doxed Post Malone and made racial comments towards a fan. Can you put this on vlog, please? Bro? Yes. <laughs> Where are you from? I'm from Kazakhstan originally, but... Oh. It sounds like you're just gonna blow someone up. Thank you so much. You like? Even when Logan had controversies of his own, Jake had to capitalize on the attention by releasing a thumbnail where he and his girlfriend posed semi-nude on top of each other. He began his boxing career in mid-2018 as the undercard match. He of course won because he faced off against Deji of all people, who was 0-4 in his boxing career for the longest time, only up until recently he got his first win. He continued in the sport, making more and more videos on it, but that didn't stop Jake from pissing people off, as he promoted the same scammy gambling website that Ricegum did. He was breaking protocols during COVID by throwing parties, and he managed to attend the 2020 riots. He didn't really participate in it, but he filmed it. He was charged with trespassing and had his whole place raided by the FBI. In 2021, more information came out about his past abusive behavior. Not only towards the former members of Team 10, but also a TikToker by the name of Justine Paradise. She claims Paul sexually assaulted her, which Jake denied. He then was called out by an actress, Rayleigh Lolly, who says he groped her while she was underage. Jake has also denied that as well. His last big controversy was in May of 2021, when he illegally drove through one of Puerto Rico's beaches. This is because many sea turtle nests are located there, so he was probably just crushing them all. Nowadays, Jake puts all of his energy towards boxing, with uploading the occasional video. He is recently reunited with his brother, Logan. Do our cell phones and play obnoxious crazy sounds. This is the baby fart prank. Woo. Sam Pepper, easily the worst prankster to ever be on the internet. After appearing throughout the 11th season of Big Brother UK, Mr. Pepper would go on to make his YouTube channel. Here he began making the goofy pranks, which turned some heads. These were just glorified acts of harassment, much of it physical. Most cited among these videos was the fake hand to ass pinch prank, which had Sam asking random women on the street for directions before fooling them by sneakily pinching their butts. It was bizarre, mind-boggling, and most of all, creepy. What happened? <laughs> yeah. What? Oh, so it's like down there. How far? Like, is it like all the way down there, or like? Sam then made a follow-up video where he did the same prank with women pinching men's asses, which did nothing to cool the flames. In fact, a movement began to ban him off YouTube, not only for making abysmal content, but because multiple girls came forward alleging him sexually abusing them. He denied this, yet still faced massive backlash from every corner of the internet. His biggest critic was Lacey Green, who made her one big video on the situation and made it an open letter to Sam. It asked for him to stop harassing women for views and gain over 100,000 signatures. Then a year later, Pepper released an even more fucked up video, the Killing Best Friend prank. In it, he kidnaps his friends Sam Goldback and Colby Brock, the latter of whom is in on the prank with him. The duo are taken to the top of a building where Brock is seemingly killed right in front of Goldback, who breaks out into tears. It actually seems genuine. Then Goldback realizes it's all fake, and we get this message that you should cherish every moment that you got, or some inspirational bullshit like that. Oh, sorry, dude. It was a prank. I'm sorry, dude. It was a prank. It was a prank, man. It was a prank. I'm okay. I'm okay, dude. I promise. I'm fine. Oh, my God. We got this sick people. Sorry, dude. Really, it was just a grossly shocking video meant to spark outrage, which it did. News outlets even covered the video, comparing it to an ISIS beheading video. Petitions were even made for YouTube to remove it, which they didn't. Instead, it was Sam who took it down after begging for over a million dollars on GoFundMe. 
In early 2016, Pepper privated all of his videos and deleted every single tweet he posted to Twitter. On February 24th of that year was the release of an apology, where he says his regrets for making the past prank videos and further denied the sexual abuse claims. I want to change. Like, I want to change my conduct. Honestly, from the depths of my heart, I want to do this as my job, but I want to do it right. And I don't want to make crap that makes people mad or upset anymore. I want to make everyone smile. I want to make everyone happy. I want everyone to be positive. And I've got to be positive in myself. Over the next few years, Sam would shift his focus to vlogs and live streaming. These were fine at first, but didn't gather the same attention he got before. Then he made a TikTok where he grew a new fan base. He presented himself as a wealthy fellow who won the lottery, which was all fake. He then got into trouble for participating in the Save the Kids crypto scam alongside our boy Rice Gum. Once it was revealed to be a pump and dump scheme, the at the time FaZe Clan member Fraser K revealed that Pepper was the mastermind behind all of it. He's not commented yet if that assertion is true or not. Family, so we just got home. We've been at Disney all day and someone broke into our house. Austin McBroom. Starting out as a successful college basketball player, Austin would soon start a relationship with Catherine Paez. The two would soon marry and have a daughter. With this new family, Austin would create the Ace Family YouTube channel. It had the typical pranks and blog style content popular by the mid-2010s, which made them all a lot of money. The problem is, Austin is known to scam people. On multiple occasions, he has held events where he tries to gain as much money as possible for himself and the Ace family. For instance, in 2018, he held a basketball event in which he promised $100,000 would go to charity, but instead, he only donated $75,000, with the other $25,000 seemingly going to Austin himself. Either it was to pay for the venue or to pocket for later. The Ace family is one strong army, and today, it was proven. It was proven. He also held an event to give out $100,000 to anyone who can do a basketball-related challenge. Only 20 could participate, which all happened to be famous influencers like the Paul brothers. There was also the YouTubers vs. TikTokers match where Austin boxed Bryce Hall. People were on his side for the most part because he was seen as a lesser of two evils when compared to Bryce. But Austin never fully paid off the event, leading to many fighters and organizers not getting completely paid. And in 2022, he held the Ace Family Fest, which was a shitty carnival with a meet and greet. The tickets were ridiculously expensive, and most people were only there to meet Austin and Catherine. He also released highly edited videos of the carnival to present it as a success, which was the opposite of what really happened. That looks like how to vomit. After walking around the event, I slowly started to realize this was not Disneyland meets Coachella. This was Tanacon meets Chuck E. Cheese in the middle of the desert. Besides the scams, lots of other incriminating stuff has come out about Austin McBroom, including his old racist tweets, seemingly faking a house robbery for a video. Oh, this is crazy. I'm so confused. They didn't take the wallet. They didn't take this stuff. What, what? Is this all mail supposed to be here? Oh, what the hell? Promoting a gambling site. Worst of all are the cheating and sexual assault allegations, which have come from multiple different people. The most damning came from Cole Kerrigan, who claims Austin, members of his team, and his own father, molested her friend. Cole would even present photo evidence of this matter, though Austin has since denied these accusations, yet continues to have a horrible reputation regardless due to his scams and faking much of his financial status. I'm going to take the scissors, look at me, and I'm going to cut its head off. God, I love you so much! Ruby and Kevin Frank. These two Mormon parents used to run the family channel, The Eight Passengers. It was your typical family-friendly vlog content where the couple and their six kids would showcase their daily lives. Ruby Frank ran the show, and invaded the kids' privacy almost all the time. In fact, she would film such events as a Birds and the Bees talk and doctor's visits. These are super uncomfortable to watch, especially after the kids themselves say they don't want to be filmed but Ruby would continue to film them either way, always ignoring her children's needs of privacy. And you know what? I'm so grateful that it's just a casserole dish and that's not my kids. Oh my goodness. I'm so glad that you're healthy and strong. Having much of their lives on film has clearly negatively affected them, as on numerous occasions, the kids have said they have no friends. This would be heartbreaking to hear for any mother, 
but Ruby doesn't really care. She just wants to exploit her kids for views. Ruby has also been accused of being neglectful, stating in one video that eating is a privilege. The youngest daughter, Eve, once forgot to pack a lunch for school, so Ruby declined to bring her one. This was despite the school calling her out about it. She did this as a form of tough love, so that Eve will never forget to pack a lunch for herself ever again. But the thing is, she's five. The girl is five years old, and the stay-at-home mom expects her to make an entire meal for herself. Many YouTubers have noted the Frank's strict parenting style, but one family member has had it worse than any other. The oldest son, Chad. Chad was mistreated the most compared to the rest of the family. He was always troubled and got expelled from school, so during the summer of 2019, at the age of 14, Kevin and Ruby sent him off to summer camp. Not just any summer adventure, but the Anasazi Foundation. This is a controversial program where Mormon teens would be sent to live in the desert. The conditions there are brutal, but this is excused due to it being some demented form of therapy. Multiple deaths have even been linked to this program. Once surviving in this place for several months, Chad's parents welcomed him back with open arms. They took him home and made a Q&A style video to allow Chad to tell his experiences at Anasazi. But for much of the video, Ruby would grow weary as Chad answers these questions as honestly as possible. Did you ever feel like giving up? No, I knew that I really couldn't. What's the point? I can't do anything about it if I give up. Chad really submitted himself to the program. These were not a good look for Ruby, who nervously laughed after many responses. It was then revealed in 2020 that Chad had not slept in a bed for seven months. Ruby explained this was a punishment for pranking his little brother, Russell. What was the prank, you ask? Well, Chad woke Russell up and made him think the family was going to Disneyland. The boy got super excited and began packing, until being told Chad lied. It was also said that Chad hung Russell from a basketball hoop, which is still pretty harmless at the end of the day. So for seven months, Ruby and Kevin forced their teenage son to sleep on a beanbag in some random room. He didn't even have his own room in the house. My bedroom was taken away for seven months and then you give it back like a couple weeks ago. I don't think our viewers know that. You've been sleeping on a beanbag. I've been sleeping on a beanbag since October. <laughs> and they gave my room back like two weeks ago. These events sparked backlash from various YouTubers and the media as a whole. So to quell this hatred for her and her parenting methods, Ruby sent cease and desist letters to multiple parties who spoke out against her. Over the past year, Chad has moved out and the eldest daughter, Sherry, has completely cut ties with her immediate family. She made an Instagram post elaborating on why. Mainly Ruby's involvement in Connections, a teaching and therapy aid made by a disgraced former therapist named Jody Hildebrand. Jody and Ruby created a mom support group on Facebook where they expressed their extremist views on parenting and religious affiliations. It is even rumored that Kevin is not okay with Ruby's involvement. Overall, Ruby's further actions will most likely break apart her remaining family, as it has her two oldest children. In my last video, I mentioned that moving forward, I was gonna be asking every single person that I spoke to for IDs, to make sure that this never ever happened again. James Charles. This beauty YouTuber has always had a spotty reputation on the website. James has always been involved with drama, including the messy back and forth banter between him and various other beauty channels in spring of 2019. The only relevant thing said during this drama came from Toddy, who describes some of James's behavior as predatory. At a birthday dinner for Toddy at a Seattle restaurant, James would flirt with the waiter, Sam Cook. Sam was bi-curious at the time, and was interested in further talking with James. The two would meet up in a hotel and make out, only for Sam to leave an hour later. He would later come to the realization that he was straight, and told James over DMs. This really pissed off Mr. Charles, who would keep insisting that Sam was gay. Another man by the name of Gage Gomez was pictured being at the 2019 Coachella with James. Some online speculated that the two were dating, until James said that they unfortunately weren't. Unfortunate for only him, as Gage was straight. James knew this, yet kept insisting that Gage was leading him on and used him for the fame. 
This drama led to more people coming out about how toxic James is as a person. He would constantly pressure straight men into hanging out with them, and got pissed off when they wouldn't get into any further relationships with him. He went off on social media, like, first of all, he blocked me on everything. He went off on social media, and this is the first time that I was, I guess, subtweeted about. Here's a screenshot. Um, the tweet about pretty boys being assholes and whatnot. That's about me. So I was blocked on everything. His drama with Toddy would lead to James losing about 3 million subscribers and set the record for losing the most subs in one single day. After making multiple apologies, James would gain most of his lost followers back. In February of 2021, accusations would emerge of James grooming a 16-year-old boy by the name of Isaiah. Despite Isaiah stating his age visible on social media, James would proceed to sex the boy on Snapchat. He proceeded to make the conversation extremely sexual and send the boy nudes, while at the same time pressuring him to do the same. Isaiah, of course, released screenshots of this. James responded saying that he did talk to him, but was told that he was 18. Maybe this was true, but that didn't matter because multiple other underage boys came forward with the same accusations Isaiah had. James addressed this in a YouTube video called, Holding Myself Accountable, where he admits to sexting two of these boys, but he prefaced that he didn't know their age, which sounds bull. This whole situation has been so embarrassing and I'm ashamed, but like I said, I'm now educated and fully understand what went on. And I'm making a promise to all of you right now on camera that I will be way more careful moving forward with every single person that I speak to. My For You page and Explore page are not dating apps, and I will stop treating them as if they are. Many parties would cut ties with James, including YouTube temporarily dropping ads. Yet after returning months later, he would continue to upload weekly content. If you look at his channel now, however, you can see that he gains less than a million views per video, despite having almost 24 million subscribers. His career is mostly dead, and that's a good thing. But what makes his case aggravating for most is that James saw the pedophilia accusations as standard YouTube drama. He associated such serious matter as simple cancel culture, which is a scary mindset to be in. In reality, this is something that should get him into serious legal trouble. I mean, there's just so many loopholes as far as like stuff that wasn't even like fact checked. Romeo Lacoste. This LA tattoo artist grew to prominence during the mid-2010s for his ink work on various celebrities and influencers. These even include other YouTubers mentioned in this video, like Jake Paul and Rice Gum, along with stars such as Ariana Grande and Justin Bieber. He pretty much used these people's fame to grow his own, and appeared on the third season of the show, Best Ink. Though it must be said that his inking skills are questionable at best, and most agree these tattoos would not last a decade. Trouble for Romeo would begin in 2016 with a group chat called Romeo's Fruit Cups. On this chat were him and young teen girls between the ages of 14 and 15, and despite knowing their ages, Romeo would go on to send sexually explicit messages about how freaky he is, which I can't read here or I'd risk having this video taken down. Despite all this being said in 2016, it wasn't until March of 2019 that these were leaked to the public, and once his seemingly true nature came out, others followed suit, accusing him of being a pedophile. One of those accusing him was Twitter user Ultra Honey, who described her relationship with Romeo. She states that they dated for over two years when she was underage and he was in his early 20s. Ultra Honey then went on to Drama Alert to retell her story there, which caught Romeo's attention, so he decided to conduct an interview of Keem, which went as badly as it possibly could. Now, say what you will about Keemstar, but he's a necessary evil. He's done some horrible things in the past, but I didn't include him on the list because of instances like this. He conducted this interview amazingly as he simply let Romeo dig his own grave. His face says it all as Romeo spouts out the stupidest nonsense possible and soon tries victimizing himself. He legit seems more concerned about being called gay than being a pedo. All I can say is that I'm absolutely, you know, if, if I've done, if, if I've made anyone feel uncomfortable, if anyone feels like they've been taken advantage of, I personally feel like I thought I did my best, okay? I thought that. I thought I was educated by the situation. I feel like I wasn't fully aware of the situation. I understand it doesn't make an excuse. This is 2016. I was new to fame. It's com it was a completely different scenario for me. Now, I literally have not been on my phone DMing people for three fucking years. Like, I don't even get on my phone because I understand how people on the internet are. 
I understand what you said, what you're saying. It is gross. It is fucked up. I mean, if people want to do that between consensual people, shit, everyone's got a freaky side. You know what yeah, I mean? Like a, a, adults are fine, but I mean, these are these are kids. After this interview was released, Romeo practically went to hiding in Mexico. He came back up in discussions when a Twitter user by the name of Mira revealed a lewd video Romeo had sent her. She went on drama alert and showed Keem the video of him flashing his dick and showing his face to the camera. That's as incriminating as you can get besides being caught on to catch a predator. This led to Romeo sending a cease and desist letter to Keem's attorneys and tried suing him for over $3 million over defamation. This of course failed and Keemstar filed a counter lawsuit and won around $100,000 for the legal fees and Romeo's 1 million subscriber play button. This is honestly the ultimate flex. After once again laying low, Romeo Lacoste attempted a music career and then got back into making tattoo content. These of course don't get that many views as he is seen as a dead channel. I'm glad he got civil justice in the court of law, but he should have gotten to criminal charges as well. He legit turned everything into standard YouTube drama, which a ton of others on the list will do. Just sickening shit. Chris Ingham. Chris and his wife Sarah run the family channel The Ingham Family. It's your standard vlog content centered around going on trips. But one thing you'll notice about their videos over the past few years is that Chris, the father, rarely shows up in them. Well that's for a good reason, as he has a nasty reputation due to some damning accusations made during the summer of 2018. A 16 year old girl by the name of Jess showed various creepy chat screenshots she had with Chris. She initially sparked conversation after learning he and the rest of the Ingums were staying at Walt Disney World. So was she, so she reached out to maybe meet the family. Jess was a huge fan and was stoked to take a photo with them. But later that night, Chris began messaging her again, flirting. He insisted she sneak out of her hotel room and go skinny dipping. So to reiterate, this creepy emo looking 30 something man wanted to get naked with a teenage girl. Yeah, creepy to the core. To the hotel room as he would ignore my messages. And then he would message me at like midnight trying to get me to sneak out again. It's like if he wanted to meet me because I was a viewer and just wanted to chat, he wouldn't do it like that. I've spoken to a couple of people about this and shown in the screenshots and they've said I'm not overreacting. She of course didn't go through with this and ceased all contact. Another girl by the name of Belle, who was 19, was also explicitly messaged by Chris with an infamous Snapchat photo being sent. Now, while she wasn't underage, it's still very messed up that he's sending stuff like this to other girls in the first place, since, you know, he has a wife. Now, while a lot of hate was being sent his way, a good amount of it was being sent to his family as well. It's honestly kind of sad that people went that far, especially when you speculate what his wife Sarah must be thinking. He even got a tattoo of her name on his arm to try and appease her. After the hatred got so big, Chris released a response video to the accusations, which backfired in so many different ways. It comes off more comical than serious with how he makes certain statements. Never in my life have I ever done anything that could be even remotely considered that. Not ever. I'm just a normal, hardworking husband and father. R normal, normal guy. Just a straightforward, normal guy. And that's it. Like, you couldn't even imagine the disgusting things that were being written about us online every single day. People talking about me being some sort of a sexual predator, a, a pedophile, a groomer, all this sort of stuff constantly, relentlessly. Not even just limited to Sarah and me. Now while most think the story ends there, things just continue to get worse. Firstly, for the couple's next two children to be born, they made exact replicas as dolls to sell online. Not only were these expensive and odd to sell, but once again, creepy. The couple has also been seen as neglectful, specifically with their youngest child, Mila. They constantly postponed her hip surgery to go on vacation and left her alone at the beach to go swimming. Besides the allegations, Chris has made other lies such as having a music career. Nowadays, the channel just posts clickbaity vlogs with little to no views and has Chris appear on camera as little as possible. Ah, boy problems. Yeah, every girl has that. Loki. Loki has gone by quite a few names during his short career on YouTube, including Davis Cedrez Gaming and Arrow. He began making Let's Play style content but shifted over to commentary videos by 2017. 
By most, he was seen as lazy and uninspired, releasing some of the most drivel reaction content. In fact, his commentaries are nothing more than just him sitting there and pointing out obvious stuff happening on screen. It's irritating, but that's not why we're talking about him today. Instead, it's due to Loki's horrible online track record, which began when people realized he uses viewbots. He also fakes his friendships with other commentary channels by subbing to their Patreon or donating money on streams and then requesting a refund at the last minute. Loki is widely known for doxing his so-called friends, such as the case with Benji, Scrubby, and Turkey Tom. Not only would he leak their addresses and similar information, but also their faces. Loki held on to these face reveals and decided to share them on Benji's Discord channel. In exchange to see these photos and get Benji to follow users on Twitter, he wanted something in return. Loki requested those on the server to send him nudes, which is already pretty degenerate. But what makes it even worse is the fact that these users were girls between the ages of 13 to 16, as Benji pointed out. Once he found out, Benji posted this information to Twitter, calling out his supposed friend for not only manipulating him, but also various underage girls. He did this on other occasions too, including with fans via text messages. He finally began getting called out by those who he had wronged by late 2018, and soon privated all his commentary videos. He did post again under the new name Arrow. Nothing changed. He now committed himself to posting Fortnite scams and live streams, yet these are not public anymore. His channel now sits with no videos and is apparently run by his brother to not risk getting completely terminated. I can't police you all the time and there's too many people that do it so I just stopped caring. Lumi Starbun Lumi is an artist who has made multiple different channels and identities online in order to evade the multiple controversies surrounding her. The trouble began in 2017 when she was accused of plagiarism by other artists. Not only would she steal other people's original characters, but also traced over people's designs. When the news spread within the community, a YouTuber by the name of Hardy McSmarty was in the process of making a video critical of Lumi. Yet she went out of her way to threaten Hardy if the video was ever published. She did it anyways, which revealed further works she plagiarized. Going back to the multiple identities part, Lumi also made a Minecraft channel where she pretended to be a man. She has also been known to fake being in certain conditions in order to quell backlash. She claimed to be autistic and makes the excuse that it makes her lack certain emotions like empathy. I think you can tell how incorrect that statement is. On Twitter, she would make multiple racist and transphobic tweets. In response to the latter, Lumi claimed she was trans. Again, not provable. Along with all that, she faked a pregnancy and two suicides, all for attention. Even worse than everything else mentioned so far is that Lumi openly defends groomers. She was even outed as being an abuser to two different men. One was a man named Matt, who she leaked the nudes of and drew him being beheaded. In 2021, her other boyfriend Kevin was lied to by Lumi relating to her age, and she threatened to have him arrested. Her main channel was deleted, but like the Hydra, many more have sprouted. But now I don't care anymore. I don't care anymore. Videos are fake. Mike and Heather Martin. Easily the worst family channel to ever grace YouTube, Daddy05 involved the hijinks of the Martin family. This includes Cody and Emma, who are also the children of Mike's ex-girlfriend Rose, and Heather's three boys, Ryan, Jake, and Alex, come from her previous marriage. Their content consists of pranks and vlogs. These pranks seemed borderline abusive at many points, including the constant belittlement of Cody, who was picked on to no end. Why do you need mirrors? You need mirrors. Can you shut up? Stop talking! You're talking over everyone and no one's even talking to you. I'm talking to him, you're talking over us, talking about nothing. Damn it! Why don't we just buy new mirrors? Mike and Heather would even encourage their oldest child, Jake, to bully his younger siblings. Multiple fights were shown on camera, along with clear psychological torment being done upon the Martin kids. One video even showed Emma being slapped across the face by Alex at the instructions of Mike. One particular video uploaded to Daddy05 was what really turned heads. The April 2017 upload dubbed The Invisible Ink Prank. In it, Heather spills invisible ink all over the carpet and blames it on Cody. Mike joins in with his wife and cusses the little boy out over and over again. 
Cody is even seen cowering in fear as he repeats that he didn't do it. Yet even when the prank is revealed to him, his father insists he does the outro. Oh, <laughs> oh, they were friend. done. I don't, I don't care what it would have done. I didn't do it. And you guys can't bring me out to do this. I'll do it. Do the outro. Thank you guys for watching this video. If you like this video and want to see more videos like this one, leave a comment down in the section below. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, and all that. No, not Snapchat and all that. No Snapchat. This video blew up, but not in a good way. Many well-known YouTubers, mainly Philip DeFranco, covered the story and advocated for something to be done. And that would indeed happen. We are now in family counseling because we need it, um, not only to get through the, you know, media stuff, but we, we need it to come back together and have everybody, even the kids, to understand what we did wrong in all this. Soon, YouTube terminated both daddy 5 and its second channel and both Mike and Heather would face legal issues. Both were charged with two separate accounts of child neglect and took a plea deal for five years probation. The couple also lost custody of Cody and Emma, who now live with their biological mother, Rose. In recent years, it was brought to light that Rose should have had custody of them all along, but Mike made it seem that she was incapable of caring for them. After the Family 05 account was terminated in mid-2018, they began a website where you have to pay $5 to watch their videos. After streaming on Twitch for a few years, a new channel would be made. But this time, it's run by the remaining Martin children, Alex, Ryan, and Jake, called The Martin Family. It mainly just features vlogs and updates. Mike and Heather would soon appear in more and more of these. In late November 2022, Mike announced the possible comeback of a Daddy 05 channel. Drop a like on it, leave a comment, show some love on it, and maybe we'll make more videos. <laughs> maybe. Who knows? I might might have some more pranks lined up. I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? Feliz 2019! Woo! Con Hua Ren. Mainly going by Reset. This Spanish YouTuber did your typical gaming and challenge videos. He has come under fire for two different instances of abuse, one on a homeless man and the other on his own cats. Starting with the latter, a fellow Spanish YouTuber, Dallas Review, made a video pointing out all of the challenges involving Reset's cats. He shows multiple instances of these felines in physical pain, even one being electrocuted by a racket. Reset denied this being abuse, yet was sent hate comments either way. He failed to provide evidence, and the drama de-escalated by early 2017. A petition was made and gained over 125,000 signatures, but it didn't affect anything. The other case of abuse was shown blatantly on camera, as it was for another challenge video. He went up to a homeless man and gave him a bag of Oreos, which of course he accepted, but these Oreos had the cream filling taken out and replaced with toothpaste. The consumption of toothpaste can actually lead to many bad side effects like nausea and stomach pains. The homeless man ate five of the Oreos and only a few minutes later got sick and vomited. Reset, however, didn't seem to care in the slightest. He said even, quote, Maybe I've gone a bit far, but I look at the positive side. This will help him clean his teeth. I think he hasn't cleaned them since he became poor. After the media backlash, he tried apologizing with another challenge video, where he tried living on the streets for 48 hours. Reset would face legal actions for pretty much drugging the man, and could have faced a possible two-year prison sentence. Instead, it seems he was restricted from going on YouTube for five years, and made to pay 20,000 euros to the man for damages. He did go on YouTube regardless, but hasn't uploaded since mid-2020. Bryant Moreland. EDP445, aka Eat That Pussy 445, is a widely known internet personality, emphasis on the personality, as he widely showcases his bombastic nature throughout his content. Bryant is a major fan of the Philadelphia Eagles, even attending the 2018 Super Bowl to watch them win. His passion for the team would go overboard on more than one occasion, which made for some of the most bizarre rants. Right, big ass fucking Darren, Darren, Darren Fells, right? He catches the ball, right? The fucking defender is like this. Oh, how's it going? 
He also did cooking videos and story times, which further boosted his appeal. To many, he seemed authentic, and he even made it on the big TV shows. Buy or sell? Women in sports. Sell! Sell. The only thing that they're going to be f***ing selling. That's hate speech, EDP. But many, many controversies began appearing in 2020. Like when YouTube denied giving him his gold play button, his remarks towards Dale Prescott, and his feud with Cold Raven. Accusations would emerge in mid-2020 that he was inappropriately messaging multiple underage fans. He denied it. But the proof just kept getting more numerous. Cold Raven showcased various chats where it appeared EDP was trying to hook up with underage users. Cold Raven even acted as an underage decoy, which worked. In response, EDP made threats against his accusers and kept denying the allegations. People were still on his side at this point, but this perception soon changed in early 2021. For two months, Chet Goldstein and his Predator Poachers crew had a decoy pretend to be a 13-year-old girl. She initiated contact with EDP, with things getting sexual on his part. He sent nudes and other gross photos to her, and soon asked to meet up. There was even one point in the chats where Bryant questioned if she was real, and if he should go through with it, which he did. On April 18th, 2021, Chet and his crew met up with EDP and confronted him in a similar style as to catch a predator. Instead of denying it this time, Bryant knew everything was over. He admitted to wanting to meet up with the minor, yet tried to downplay it as saying that he wanted to pick up a cupcake. Again, so what brings you out here today? Um, well, I was uh, coming out here to- Glasses off. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I was actually coming out here to pick up a cupcake <laughs> and then go back home. Um, there was, you know, nothing that was going to be sexual involved because I'm not like that, you know? Well, obviously the text messages and stuff like that, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, that was all that was going to happen. Oh, okay. So you should title a video instead of, you know, your video almost through hands with a 13 year old. You should title your video almost with a 13 year old. I think that'll get a lot of hits, EDP. I think so. Yeah. Now, while Chet's intentions were good, he himself is not a good person, and he has his fair share of accusations. He also made it harder for Bryant to be charged, even after calling authorities during the confrontation. The video went live on YouTube, and it was all over for EDP. He privated all of his videos, and had all of his accounts terminated only a few days later. He has since tried posting content to other sites, which never worked. He would get banned or just flat out harassed in order to evade further attention. He changed his name to Dion Eason and constantly moved state to state looking for a job that won't fire him. Guys, Linemaker here from Linemaker Studios bringing you once again another episode of Hide and Seek. Marcus Wilton. Formerly known for his Survival Madness series, Linemaker was a Minecraft YouTuber with almost 800,000 subscribers. He began collaborating with other well-known Minecraft YouTubers and grew a mostly younger audience. But sadly, he used that fact to his advantage, as he would go on to share explicit messages with underage fans. Keemstar was one of the first to bring it up in a Drama Alert episode uploaded on September 19th, 2015. In it, Keem interviews a mother who claims the Lion Maker tried to ask her 13-year-old daughter for nudes via Twitter DMs. The mother then DM'd him back, telling Lion Maker that the girl was underage and he didn't seem to care. Well, at this point in time, I didn't know he was 27 or 26 or whatever age he's supposed to be. It was just, this was a person that I had, I had no idea who was asking my 13-year-old daughter for nudes. And that was, for fans, go inappropriate. Absolutely. With this news coming to light, many of Marco's buddies, including Stampy Longhead, stopped associating with him. More underage individuals came forward to tell their experiences with Line Maker, including a 15-year-old boy who was paid $5,000 to send nudes to the Minecrafter. He even sent proof of this, like chat screenshots and a PayPal transaction itself. Keemstar then made a short Twitter video further calling out Line Maker, which led to him firing tweets back. Here he flat out states he's in a relationship with a 15-year-old girl. So not only did he confirm the allegations, but he tweeted a nude photo of her. His only excuse at this point was to say he was hacked, but nobody bought it. This girl, who he was in a relationship with, Paige the Panda, had actually appeared in some Minecraft Let's Plays he did. 
She would go on to apologize, which is heartbreaking as Marco should be the one to do so. The final nail in the coffin would be drilled in by Nicolasso's Crazy, who made two videos on the allegations. The second was an interview of Marcos himself, uploaded in November 2016. Colossal was extremely professional during this interview, while Lionmaker kept dancing around the questions and making himself even more guilty than he already was. So, explain the situation. What happened? How did Page the Panda's asshole end up on your Twitter? I, I really would appreciate, I understand that, you know, for your channel, but please do not. This isn't for my channel, this is a fact. I understand that, but A 16-year-old girl's but, asshole was posted on your Twitter. But you want me to dial down the words? No, it's not that. It's, it's, disrespecting, it's disrespecting a, a young girl that's already been through enough. But these are the you know? facts. You want me to like, say No, you're, you're, you're focusing the, the whole thing. Term? You're focusing the whole thing around a teenage girl. You're focusing the whole thing. You, but this is what happened, Lion Maker. It's not this is a what fact. happened. It's not what happened. Oh, it's do, not do you what deny happened. that a picture of this girl, Page the Pandas, what should we call it? What do we call this? A rectum was posted on your Twitter account. Let's let's just st state it out how it is. That is a no, fact. No, I do not deny that. I do not okay. deny that. Who posted this picture? That is something that I cannot say. I do not know. It's impossible for me to start pointing fingers at someone and saying- Speculate, theorize. No, I can't. It was rumored that shortly after this, he was arrested relating to the messages sent to the first girl, but it doesn't seem true. During the year he was supposed to be in jail, he still uploaded and later claimed the notion to be false. In December 2018, Paige finally came out for her side of the story. With the video she released, Paige describes the relationship she was in with Line Maker and how manipulative he was. She took him to court where he pleaded guilty and got probation. If he commits another similar act, he will be sent to prison for four years. He will still upload content to his YouTube channel, even mentioning all the drama from years before. His account would be terminated in September 2020, yet brought back only a few months later. It's weird that it was even brought back, as it got terminated again shortly thereafter. He's now the punchline to the joke that all Minecraft YouTubers are pedophiles, or that they end up being awful people in general. And get this, he isn't the only one on the list. I'm most excited for the fact that you guys are going to be able to get a more inside look at Team Crafted and how we operate on a Adam Dahlberg. Running the Sky Does Minecraft channel, Adam used to be one of the most subscribed to YouTubers at one point. This was around the early to mid 2010s with his involvement in the popular Team Crafted group. We're going to be a whole movie in together, we're going to be doing comedy skits, and we're going to be just. He did leave in 2014, but on friendly terms. Adam even showed up in the anniversary special. He still uploaded gaming content up until 2017, when he shifted his focus to making music. He changed the Adam vs. Gaming channel into Net Nobody Live, and changed his main channel from Sky Does Minecraft to Sky Does Anything. With this, he began branching out his content, including doing live action skits. This is it, dude! This is it, it's Pokemon time, dude! It's Pokemon time, dude! I don't, no, no, it's not, Adam. Adam was potentially going to delete all his old Minecraft videos, but at the last minute, reversed this decision. Now, where this story gets messed up is with a document that was released on January 23rd, 2022. It was written by his former girlfriend, Elizabeth, who described how abusive their several month relationship was. It also brought more attention to previous bits of drama Adam had been involved with, including some with former members of Team Crafted. In the document, Elizabeth describes how Adam pressured her to get pregnant and not tell the public about it. He would cheat on her multiple times and discuss wanting to be in a polyamorous relationship. He would yell at her for the littlest things. He would be violent and even elbow her. After getting to the hospital, he tried fighting the staff. He scammed companies to give him money so he could buy drugs, and she also claimed that Adam sexually assaulted other women and sent explicit photos to minors. And also tons of other horrible things, like the terrible treatment of Adam's ex Alessa and their son. Some abuse allegations were even mentioned in a diss track KSI made on Adam back in 2017. Adam's career online was already dead by the time this document came out, so he attempted one last scheme. In May 2022, he tried selling his channel for nine hundred thousand dollars. Donzel Owens, originally going by Plasma Dude Forty Seven, Donzel is an elderly YouTuber. Who began making videos back in two thousand and seven. 
His name comes from the fact he used to be a plasma cutter before his retirement. In 2012, he would end up making a new YouTube channel called Plasma Master Don. Since his previous one was hacked and removed, people began subscribing to Donzel due to his wholesome nature. He did a lot of song covers, which weren't good, but people applauded him for trying. You have loved me like I was somewhere else. Oh well, can't you see? Though public reception on Donzel would change in a post on the Morbid Reality subreddit, YouTuber Nick Rowley would stumble upon it and make a video detailing his findings about Plasma Master Don. Uploaded on December 11th, 2020, Nick shows proof of Don being a registered sex offender. On the official registry site, it shows an arrest for Donzel Edwards Owens Jr., who not only looks like Plasma Master Don, but has the same birthday and location. The car listed on there was even the same model Don mentioned in one of his videos, a 2005 white Buick Century. This was clearly him, meaning this wholesome elderly man was actually a predator this entire time. A child predator, as Donzel would not only have creepy interactions with underage fans, but something more diabolical. His 2019 arrest mentioned before was for touching an underage boy's genitals. Around the time the Reddit post was made, Donzel made the announcement that he would stop making videos due to his declining health. Most thought this was an excuse since he was facing backlash, but that statement was most likely true. Because on December 21st, 2020, Donzel passed away due to an unspecified illness. He was 73. Gregory Daniel. This is one of my personal favorites. For years, Onision was the quintessential controversial YouTuber. Ever since he put on that banana costume and began singing, the attention he got was never for the right reasons. Due to how many controversies he's been in, why don't we list them off? First in 2009, he made a video titled Murder Eaters, where he rants about those who eat meat and angrily calls them murderers. I am talking about life and death. I'm sorry you don't appreciate the life of other living beings, but I happen to. But trust me, as soon as people are murdering you genocide style, I will be there to back you. But until then, I'm going to fight for something that matters. Had a messy divorce with his wife and made multiple videos on the subject decided to film his girlfriend Shiloh's seizure instead of calling 911, was accused of rape and decided to slut-shame the person, leading him to get banned from VidCon 2012, killed his pet tortoise by placing it under a plastic bin while it was scorching outside, had a show on his second channel where he would rate women on a number scale, usually making horrible comments about their bodies. Some of these girls were even underage. This girl looks pretty incredible from head to knee. In fact, your body's pretty close to perfection. And this girl's body, I'd say, needs some work. In fact, it looks like she just had a baby. So maybe breastfeed a ton, you know, have that little kid suck the calories right out of you and eat really healthy. You might find your body looking great again in no time. Girl... Onision posted a horrid tweet about Christina Grimmy after her tragic death in June of 2016. He even started a beef with her brother while he was trying to grieve. And in 2018, he cut down multiple wildlife protected trees, which was illegal, forcing him to pay hefty fines. While all of this is horrible, nothing compares to the large amount of abuse allegations made towards Onision during the late 2010s. Greg and his spouse Kai Avaro would have an incredibly predatory relationship with a girl named Sarah. Sarah was a 14-year-old fan of Kai's who would move in with them and Greg, soon obtaining legal custody of her. This is bizarre for multiple reasons, especially since the couple was grooming the underage girl, they even had her make videos denying this, which instead fueled the flames even more. Sarah lived with them up until late 2017, when she was kicked out. Yet she was still on good terms with the duo and would visit periodically. In 2018, when Sarah was 17, Kai sent her explicit photos of themselves. Right when she turned 18, she described how all of them had sexual relations. Onision, along with Kai, who is seen just as guilty here, were always way too sexual with this underage girl, who they saw as nothing more than an object. When all of this came out in 2019, his other abuse allegations were brought up, along with how young some of his ex-girlfriends were. The one and only Chris Hansen began investigating Onision due to all of these claims, including interviewing the women involved. In January 2020, Chris flew to Washington State to interview Onision in person, leading to the infamous 911 call. Hi, uh, there's a person who's been stalking me online and they just showed up to my house. Okay, and they're outside now? 
Yes, they're knocking on my door. Okay. And do you know if they have any weapons? They have a bunch of camera people, like they're YouTube, they're YouTube stalkers. Onision refused an interview from Insider as well, though this was because agreed. Greg wanted $10,000, which nobody in their right mind would give him that. Only two days after the Chris Hansen encounter, Onision's daughter fell 20 feet from their home, resulting in multiple skull fractures. Despite all these events happening in 2019 and early 2020, Onision did not face any repercussions at all. Actually, he attempted to sue both Hansen and YouTuber Repsion, which ultimately failed. In fact, he was denied protection from both parties. Then in early 2021, a documentary produced by Chris on Onision's life was released to Discovery+. Plus. This seemed to be the final decision maker into YouTube demonetizing all of Greg's channels. With his views dwindling and no new ways to monetize his content, he tried making children's songs. These actually show up on YouTube Kids, leading to a Twitter user reporting it. Overall, Onision is a manipulative groomer who emotionally and sexually abuses those closest to him. He's full of hatred and malice, doing whatever he can to cause outrage and more attention towards his brand as a whole. Christian Chandler. Chris Chan is known for many things, including being one of the most well-documented people on the internet. He's the creator of Sonichu, who has been trolled by other internet users to no end. While some can blame his more heinous behavior on his neglectful upbringing and questionable mental state, some of the things Chris has done are still atrocious. I know you. You're just a pussy. You're just a pussy. You're just a dang lowlife. You do not deserve to live, you mother beeper. Many claim that his downfall began in late 2011 due to the death of his father. Only a month after his passing on October 28th, Chris and his mother drove to the Notorious Game Place after hearing it had new management. Chris Chan was banned from the Game Place by its owner Michael Snyder for, well, being Chris Chan. Michael escorted him out and was then hit by their car. Yes, Chris and his mother Barb hit Michael and then fled the scene, soon being arrested. Barb tried fighting back but was subdued. Both were charged, but barely faced any serious repercussions. The mother and son were made to pay $1,000 to Michael, and Barb did community service. Over the next couple of years, things just got worse and worse. His house burned down, he maced a GameStop employee. Don't call anybody. <laughs> Kept wasting money on random crap, harassed various voice actresses on Twitter, and made death threats to several people. Chris began believing in a supposed dimensional merge, which various groups online tricked him into believing. Chris and Barb were also going into debt, and her health was getting worse. Then came Noel, the current owner of Kiwi Farms, who offered to help Chris Jan. He would act as a manager of sorts, helping Chris financially as long as he did some work himself. That work was via art commissions, which worked up until mid-2021. On July 29th, audio leaked between Chris and one of his trolls named Isabella Loretta Jenke. On the leaked call, Chris revealed he had been having sexual relations with an elderly woman for some time now. Horrifically, this was proven to be his own dementia-ridden mother. We won't get into the details, but Chris would be arrested on August 1st. Look up, eat the rock, kill stream. I live here in Richmond, buddy. Man, move the camera. No, come to, come to the kill stream first. The few people still supportive of him, like Noel, cut all ties. He is currently being held in various mental institutions until all trials are completed. His channel is still up and shows off lots of distressing footage of himself and Barb, giving us a better look at how horrible things truly were. So, I recently purchased some hamsters from PetSmart. Leighton Laboot. The only flush of someone so vile and messed up that I covered him on the 12th episode of Disturbing YouTube Videos and Channels. He's an animator known for crude claymation figures, typically in gruesome situations. Characters would be stabbed, ripped apart, sexually abused, and flat out tortured. A lot of this would be perpetrated by Itchy the Clown, a character inspired by serial killer John Wayne Gacy. Leighton began making these animations in 2013, but started posting them to Dolly Flesh in 2016. He then made a gaming channel called Flesh Dolly, which was surprisingly normal. Not only would he do claymation content, but also videos of him using sculptures. 
These IRL skits were pretty messed up too, like him squirting milk from clay boobs, making this creepy mask, and eating a clay infant. Okay, he makes disturbing content, so what? The only thing he's harming people with is that ugly classic telephone looking ass haircut, right? You would be mistaken. Layton made various posts on both Twitter and YouTube involving the adoption of two pet hamsters. The first video showing this was uploaded on May 14th, 2019, showing him simply playing with the little rodents on his bed. The next day, he uploaded another of him brutally torturing them. Both hamsters were stabbed, amputated, drowned, crushed, and put in the microwave. This video was almost immediately taken down and the fans of Dolly Flesh began contacting authorities. Though, for some reason, he wasn't arrested until May of the next year. He was charged with two counts of animal abuse and murder, yet posted bail. People were so mad about this that they stood outside his home to protest. He never faced any jail time and was simply under four to five years under supervision, not being allowed near pet shops and having a curfew. How he was never made to serve a prison sentence is beyond crazy. I'm sure you've heard this before, but murdering animals is one of the leading signs of a future serial killer. Layton himself admitted he tortured the hamsters just because he was bored. According to some sources, in a video he even admitted to stepping on and killing a baby duck. Dolly Flesh is a monster, who will hopefully never return to YouTube. His channel was taken down for clear reasons. Matias Oyarzo This is the name of a Chilean man who murdered multiple cats just for the hell of it. You will recognize him more as Paluchin Entertainment, which is the name of his channel that began in 2014. Here he mainly just uploaded Let's Play content and poorly done sketches using either stuffed animals or Microsoft Paint, which were always violent. Over time, he turned into a full-on internet troll, ruthlessly calling out fellow creators and showing signs of being a bigot. He tacked people based on race, nationality, commonly targeting Mexicans, Brazilians, Americans, and Venezuelans. During one of his live shows, Matias was heard masturbating and moaning the name of his crush, and he sent the audio of it to his friend, who then spread the word to his crush instead of the intended group chat. Matias also reportedly sexually assaulted multiple classmates, which he was investigated for by Chilean authorities. He wasn't charged at all for any of that. In December of 2019, a recently uploaded video from Paluchin Entertainment began spreading around due to how shocking it was. The clip showed Matias abusing his cat Jason Kruger, which he had done multiple times before. He ended up throwing, kicking, and hitting the feline with a spoon until it was paralyzed. Jason Kruger would soon die due to its injuries. Sadly, this wasn't the only cat he abused, as only a short while later, Matias adopted two new kittens. With them, he shoved them in a dirty toilet bowl. Even after multiple sources called him out and advocated for his arrest, Matias didn't budge. Instead, he doubled down and threatened to kill more cats, and maybe even his own mother. And he had killed more cats, as he sent photos of their corpses to those who pissed him off. This case didn't receive widespread media attention until September of 2020, when renowned commentator Critical called out Matias' actions. Charlie advocated for the termination of Paluchin Entertainment with the Answer Us YouTube hashtag. Many like him hated the double standards on YouTube, as certain channels were being unfairly deleted, while others like Paluchin Entertainment would face no consequences at all. The closest thing that would happen to Matias was his expulsion from school due to the video. YouTube did listen for once though, and terminated Matias' channel by the end of that month. He has since tried to return on multiple occasions, and is active on a channel called A Rev. Wouldn't be surprised if this too gets rightfully removed. Matias is clearly an extremely sick individual and needs to be locked away. But in a similar case to Dolly Flesh, that most likely won't happen. Both are completely horrific individuals who abuse animals just for the pleasure of it. So I'm not sure if it's a thing where I'm a sinful Christian. Well, we're all Christians are sinners, but. Anthony Powell. Anthony is one of the earliest YouTubers on this list, first making content in mid-2007, but his content was incredibly hateful as it contained rants about those he deemed detestable. Anthony hated all religions besides his own of Christianity, including atheism which he had a special attention to. But what he hated more than anything were women, 
who he commonly criticized for not being submissive enough, particularly black women who he claims are too promiscuous. Anthony's videos are frequently taken down by YouTube, including his entire first channel, Tony48219, but he was always bounced back, creating another and making even more aggressive videos. By 2009, he began targeting fellow YouTuber Asia McGowan, who represented everything he hated. Asia was a young African-American woman who considered herself an atheist and had many progressive views. Anthony Powell began cyber-stalking her, soon realizing that she attended the same campus as her at Henry Ford Community College in Dearborn, Michigan. By this time, his small audience grew concerned over his decreasing mental state. Anthony declined to take his medication, stated that he was scared, and bought a shotgun. On April 10, 2009, Anthony entered the McKenzie Fine Arts Center, a building on campus where Asia currently had class. He located her in one of the classrooms and opened a fire. Multiple gunshots were heard throughout the building, with two casualties being found. Not only had Asia been killed, but Anthony as well. He murdered his only target and shot himself in the head. Once the dust had settled, online debates sprung up trying to figure out if this could have been prevented. Anthony's parents were aware of his worsening mental condition and didn't do anything much about it. YouTube would terminate his remaining accounts on the platform, leading to most of his hateful videos being considered lost. The same fate would fall upon Asia McGowan, despite her channel remaining up for years after her death. In September 2021, her channel was hacked and changed to Ripple Global. It was terminated only a few days later, though some of her content is available for a viewing on the Internet Wayback Machine. Uh, what I have here today to show you is a High Point. Now, uh, for those of you that are familiar with High Point, Trey Sessler. Going slightly further back than the previous entry, Trey set many precedents on YouTube, including being considered one of the pioneers of the online anime community. But before that, he performed skits and short films, some even involving his family. The channel Lenscat Productions then became known for his anime reviews, which were seen as honest and straightforward insights into these shows. Trey went on to refer himself to the one and only Mr. Anime, and would be highly respected by his peers. It was also made by a company guy or whatever named Groover. Not sure what the fuck Groover is, or who he is, I don't really want to know. And with that said, let's get to the plot of Green Green. Going into the 2010s, he shifted his content once again to making gun videos. He would review various weapons and fire them off at targets. Yet those who were concerned about this abrupt change were quelled by the video he made condemning the rise of mass shootings. I'm a firearms owner myself, but uh, it's, uh, it is it is a little bit disturbing to know that you could be a victim in something like this at these times. All the people that were victims... You think it won't happen to me, but sometimes it does. But seriously, every day I open Yahoo, I'm like, well, time to see what today, time to see what today's shooting is, and hey, there's another one. So I don't know when it's gonna stop. I think it's what nobody knew at the time is that Trey would slowly plan to commit one of his own. In February of 2012, Trey announced he would be taking an extended three-week break from making videos, needing that time to reward himself. On March 13th, he came back to announce that he got a new job in a field he found interesting. With this, he stated how less videos would be made to focus on his new job. I want to thank you guys a lot for sticking with me and watching the channel. Uh, I got more subscribers than ever. I have more views than ever. And uh, everything is going really good. So um, I'll probably be putting out some blog videos, like I said. And I hope you enjoy those blog videos. I hope you definitely enjoy those. What job did he get, you ask? Well, we never found out. He might have used this as a cover for something he was planning, which nobody had even suspected at that point. Trey planned to commit a mass shooting at Waller High School, which was just down the street from where he lives. Before he did so, he decided to kill his entire family. He didn't want his parents and brother to know the pain of seeing their own flesh and blood commit such a heinous act, so he murdered all three of them one by one. Trey lured his mother Rhonda into the garage and shot her in the chest at point-blank range. He then shot his brother Mark in the living room, which woke up his dad. Trey murdered Lawton as well, and then killed all the family pets. He tore the house down bit by bit and wrote various messages on the walls. One of them read, quote, Why did I do this? I love my mom, dad, and brother. Trey soon made his way to the high school, planning to murder around 70 students and become the deadliest school shooter of all time. 
Instead, he grew cold feet and went back home, getting arrested soon after. During the interrogations, Trey revealed he had been planning to commit a shooting for a long time. He commonly idolized school shooters and even ranked them. But in the end, he regretted all of this and was sent to life in prison. He requested his rights to parole to be taken away, believing himself to be a potential danger to everyone outside in the free world. I was originally just going to do it like just one big flip and whatever it was going to be, it was going to be it. The first one was Tails anyway. Randy Stare. Randy began Pioneer's Productions at just 15 years old, where he uploaded a series of skits with his toys. They were bizarre for a 15 year old to make, but he seemed to have fun creating these bizarre episodes. The series would run until the mid-2010s, where he started a new channel called Ember's Ghost Squad. Ember McLean was one of the villains from the Nickelodeon show Danny Phantom, who Randy had a deep obsession with. So much in fact that he dedicated this entire account to making videos about her and the fictional squad. Each of them were just recolors of the character, voiced by random people Randy hired off the internet. For years I've had a recruit by my side, Ember Flores, helping me get my feet wet for what was inevitably ahead. Randy even made multiple Twitter accounts posing as these made-up characters, each having layered conversations with each other. His mental state at this point was questionable at best, not only becoming obsessed with Ember, but also the concept of death as a whole. Randy wanted to be part of Ember's ghost squad, referring to her as his wife, while struggling with gender dysphoria. He would go as far as to refer to himself as Andrew Blaze, a self-insert female character, just like Mr. Anime, Randy became obsessed with school shooters, soon wanting to become one. He would make multiple blog posts and videos detailing his struggles, including his need to commit suicide. He thought by killing himself that he would, no joke, be able to join Ember's Ghost Squad. This is how delusional he was. This man thought he could realistically join a fictional group he created for the sake of a YouTube series. By mid-2017, he decided to take action. Randy left his fate up to a coin toss. If it landed on heads, he would kill himself at his home. If it landed on tails, he would do it at his job, a local grocery store known as Weiss. After doing this five times, it landed on tails three to two. So not only would his man end his own life, but sadly, he would take others with him. That is a tails, folks. Tails. Which means there's going to be a loss of a human life besides my own. Possibly more than one. That's fate for you. It all began on June 7th, 2017. Randy uploads one final video to Ember's Ghost Squad, where his characters come into a school shooting. He then made various vague tweets, and then posts his so-called suicide tapes. At 11pm that night, Randy headed to work and blocked off all emergency exits. He went on to kill three people, all of which were his co-workers. Then he pointed a shotgun at his mouth and took his own life. The fact that such a mentally disturbed man had to selfishly take other people's lives is sickening. And for what? A self-made delusion about a cartoon character? As of 2021, all of his accounts have been taken down by YouTube. Um, you know, I'm polite. I'm the ultimate gentleman. Elliot Roger. The most notorious of all YouTube killers. Elliot's heinous actions would shock the entire world. Growing up, his family was pretty well off, mainly due to his father, Peter, being a somewhat successful filmmaker in Los Angeles. Despite this, Elliot's parents divorce and he showed signs of mental illness. His mother claims he has Asperger's Syndrome, though he was never officially diagnosed. Instead, it seems he was diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. Elliot was bullied a lot in school and resented his peers, making it difficult for him to make any friends at all. Because of this, he spent more time online, beginning both a blog and a YouTube channel by mid-2011. During this time, Elliot moved to Isla Vista to attend college, which he dropped out by the beginning of 2012. He would grow increasingly misogynistic due to his inability to talk to women, later dubbing himself an incel. He constantly posted about his loneliness and struggles in life, chalking it up to women not giving him the attention he thinks he deserves. Elliot would go as far as to harass people in public, including spilling coffee on girls or using a super soaker filled with orange juice on a group of people playing kickball. In July 2013, he attended a house party in which he attempted to push multiple girls off a 10-foot ledge. This failed, and Elliot was pushed over instead. 
He lost his prized sunglasses in the scuffle, and vowed revenge against the men who shoved and mocked him. Following this night, a plan began to form. I've been attending college in Santa Barbara for about two and a half years now. And in those two and a half years, I've experienced nothing but loneliness and misery. And my problem is girls. There are so many beautiful girls here, but none of them give me a chance. Elliot's YouTube uploads grew more concerning by spring 2014, leading to his own parents alerting authorities. Police did show up to his apartment to question him on his mental state. They had no legal reason to search the place, and they left, not knowing that within his room were multiple guns. He continued posting videos, with one showing Elliot watching a random couple at the park and ranting about them. This... this is the reason why life isn't fair. Why does that guy get to have such a beautiful girlfriend while I'm all alone? Another titled, Life is So Unfair, has him walking around Isla Vista and blaming everyone else for his misery. This is my usual sunset spot, mainly because there's rarely any young couples here that I would get jealous of. And I love this walk right down the parking lot towards the setting sun. By this point, it was clear what would come next. On May 23rd, 2014, the day of retribution began. He started by stabbing his two roommates and their friend in order to use the apartment as some sort of torture center. This didn't end up happening, so Elliot shifted into phase two of the plan. He uploaded his retribution video to his channel and emailed his manifesto to multiple parties. And I will slaughter every single spoiled, stuck-up, blonde slut I see inside there. He then drove to the Alpha Phi sorority house in order to wage a war on women. The place was locked, so he shot and killed two random girls nearby. He then drove his car downtown in order to run over as many people as possible. Besides a man he shot at, nobody else was killed. Police eventually caught up with him, shooting Elliot in the hip. He then stopped his car and shot himself in the head. In total, six people besides Elliot were killed in what has become known as the Isla Vista Massacre. Elliot Roger has since become known by many names, including the Supreme Gentleman and the Incel Killer, both in a way to make fun of him. Instead of being known as a hardcore killer, most choose to mock Elliot for his ludicrous viewpoints and overall failures. No part of his plan listed in the manifesto went according to plan, including the theft of his father's car or the break-in of the Alpha Phi sorority house. It's still horrible how his actions led to the deaths of innocent people, and how the signs were there for the longest time. Elliot will forever be known as the worst YouTuber of all time.